now I would like to present information assurance strategist with MUST, Military uh, Intelligence and Security Services. All right, that, that's correct, right? Jan Wynsche, an applaud. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I get to a lucky spot to try to keep you awake after lunch. Uh, I don't know, I'm... I'm I consider myself, uh, or at least from the beginning, an uh, engineering or tech kind of guy. I don't know what, what you're like. So how many, how many of you are considering yourself tech guys? Uh, that's good. And uh, boring upper management types. Okay. So a couple of honest people there. And uh, I'm not really going to talk a lot about technology today, so I'm going to address those four or five people. Uh, what I'm going to say uh, is uh, uh, slightly touches on some of the points that have been uh, talked about earlier today, but maybe from a little bit different perspective, uh, military perspective or intelligence perspective. Um, so, before I go on with that, I want to talk a little about the box I work in. Uh, and as you heard, it's called MUST. Uh, and I think a lot of people think that's a really secretive, uh, strange organization, and you don't know much about us. You think we're a black box. Um, and that's not really strange, because we have an heritage from uh, strange organizations called uh, the T Office and the C Bureau. Uh, and uh, those had something of an air of spy romance, I guess. Uh, but most is different, and, and we're much more open today. And uh, most is actually an acronym that, that stands for something, uh, rather than, than just C or T or something from the alphabet. Uh, so we're the Military Intelligence and Security Service. And we're part of, of the Swedish Armed Forces. Uh, as you can tell from the name, uh, we have two things to do. We have two things in our remit. Uh, and the first, of course, is intelligence. Uh, and in, in that capacity, we are supplying the armed forces and, and the government with uh, intelligence about foreign threats and foreign developments, political and so on. And, and we're an all-source uh, intelligence agency, so we work with many different ways of, of gathering intelligence. But the other part is the security part, and that's where I'm, I'm located. Uh, and there's, there's no watertight seal between those two parts, but they're separate. And, uh, as a security guy, I don't know everything that goes on in the intelligence side, so please don't ask me about intelligence gathering, because I'm not going to be able to answer that. Uh, on the security side, we work with the security for the Swedish Armed Forces. So when we gather uh, intelligence for that task, we're interested in threats against the armed forces not threats against Sweden in, in general. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one part. So we're protect, trying to protect armed forces. Um, and for that reason, when I say us in, in the speech, I'm often going to be referring to the armed forces rather than just must, because we work as a whole to, to provide this, uh, this security. Uh, there's still a lot of need for, for secrecy in, in this kind of business. So I'm not going to do any case studies or anything here. Uh, but I'm going to try to be as open as, as possible. And I, I think we are much more open now. Uh, and, and we have a lot of collaborations with other, um, other agencies in Sweden. And you can see some of them on the screen. Uh, one in particular I would like to mention is NSIT, which is a natural collaboration for, uh, uh, against IT threats. So that's uh, most together with uh, 
FRA and the Security Service, or SAPL for, for those of you that know Swedish abbreviations in this area. Uh, another is, is the website informationssäkerhet.se, uh, which uh, is, is geared towards uh, other agencies or, or government agencies that, that need to implement uh, better information security in general. So how, how to implement uh, that in an organization. And I guess through all these uh, collaborations with other agencies, we are actually reaching out. And I, I hope that uh, me speaking here today, I'm, I'm really happy I got the chance to do that, by the way, uh, is, is part of that. Trying to be open, trying to, to um, tell you a little about how we look at the threats and, and, and the landscape. And uh, all these collaborations are, are, are important. And I think industry may be moving much faster in this area than, than we as a government agency are. Um, there are a lot of collaborations between uh, different uh, IT security vendors sharing threat intelligence and so on. Uh, and there's also vertical market collaborations with different uh, markets uh, also sharing information. So that's, that's important and I think Maybe, maybe we're slower in, in government and especially in the defense and, and intelligence community because we're not quite used to sharing with, with others outside that small community. We're, uh, we want to exchange information with other partners in other countries and get something in return. And we're perhaps not used to, to this. Uh, but, but we're getting there, I think. Uh, and uh, when we don't, there's usually a really good reason for it. Um, we, there's a, a very real need to protect our sources and our partners. Uh, when we get information from a partner, that's, uh, we can't reveal all, all the time where it comes from, and we can't reveal all the information. And sometimes there is a human source behind the information that can actually get really hurt in physical life if this information is, is revealed. So the, the, the need for secrecy is still there, but uh, I hope we're moving towards being able to, to share as, as much as possible. So that, that said, I want to go on, uh, and I want to start uh, about 100 years ago. This is a picture from a, a different conflict, and. I, sort of shows the state of art of IT and the military in that time. Um, what was happening then? Well, information technology was in its infancy. Computers, of course, were like 40 years uh, into the future still, but uh, telephones were there. Um, electromechanical uh, computing, uh, encryption devices were emerging. Uh, and uh, there were also the first attacks, uh, you know, eavesdropping, uh, wiretapping, uh, and uh, even uh, false signaling, and all, all those sorts of simple attacks were, were coming. Uh, but the military, and, and even more so society in general, wasn't very much dependent on IT. So those, those attacks, or, or even the attacks that, that we could do today wouldn't have hurt a military force very much back then. Uh, of course, uh, today's computing power would have been a really a great edge if you want to decrypt messages back then. That's, that's true, but uh, I don't think that anything that, that we could do with, with a computer attack back then or an information technology attack of some kind would have made much difference. On the other hand, uh, any other type of modern weaponry or in, in you know, the land or the air or sea arenas where you fought the wars back then would have made a really big difference. And what's the point I want to make with this? Well, it's that the, the cyber arena has uh, a difference from, from the others. And it's that the, the use we make of the technology is what makes us vulnerable. So we, we have a choice, 
or we used to have a choice, uh, in, in how dependent on this technology we want to be and how it's going to hurt us. Well, today the picture is very much different. Uh, we heard that before in the other talks. Um, cyberspace is uh, part of our daily lives. Sometimes I think I live more in an online world than in the physical world. Um, and that's even, even more true with, with children these days. And as a consequence, we're growing much, much more vulnerable to these attacks. And the landscape is getting more and more complex and difficult to understand and control. So, you all know what this is, clouds. So that's, um, I'm not even going to talk about how complex your own uh, internal IT structures are getting and how much uh, of the, the old technology, the uh, you still have and how difficult it is to secure that. But what's happening now is that uh, we're more and more outsourcing things, putting in the cloud, uh, buying uh, IT services, offshoring development, and putting IT outside of our own immediate control. And I don't think anybody uh, or any big organization uh, is, is uh, any different. We all, we all do this. Uh, we do it. Of course, we keep uh, the information that's most sensitive, we keep close to the body, but uh, a lot of information is actually out there in somebody else's computers. And taken together, even if every single piece of information is not that critical, taken together, all of this is going to probably be critical for some part of your business. And as different parts of your organization are procuring these services, not really thinking of them as IT services all the time, you probably are not going to put the right requirements on those procurements, and you're not going to have the right security. And the, the information landscape that you're ha your information is in is getting more and more complex all the time. That's not all. You have all the devices that your users are using. And this is my home phone, but I think you know what kind of devices I'm talking about. Uh, bring your own device. But even if you have a bring your own device policy or actually forbids people to bring their own devices, that's not going to stop them. Everybody has their information on their own device. If it's more convenient for a user to do something on their own computer or own phone, they're going to find ways to get their information there. Um, email is, is the obvious answer. Mail it to your private email account and, and work on it at home. So that's another area where the information is, is less and less in your control. Next are the partners. And now I'm not talking about the, your, your cloud service partners or, or the IT service partners, but all the other people you do business with, your suppliers, your customers, um, anything, uh, anybody that you do business with. In very many cases, I'd say every case, you actually have to transfer information to those, or they collect information about you, about your customers, about your employees. Consider travel services. How much information does your travel agency have about your, your employees and how they travel? Insurance, um, news services, uh, phone services, how much information does uh, the phone company have about your users? 
uh, and, and even government, the tax authorities, you send information to them. So you have a lot of other players that are actually holding information that, uh, well, it's difficult to say who owns what data, but it's certainly data that's critical to you and it's about your employees or your customers. And this is even more poorly understood, I think, in most organizations, what data is actually uh, processed in this way. And if it's even more likely that these services are not going to be procured by the IT department. There's someone else who's going to buy that. And finally, the infrastructure. Uh, all the underlying services that both you buy, build your IT on and that your suppliers, uh, employees, partners build their IT on. So, um, does, does your uh, partners have their own uh, storage or is it outsourced to somebody else? What uh, company is actually owning the cables that your, your phone calls or, or your data is on? So all of these are increasing the, the uh, complexity. And unfortunately, or, or maybe that's not unfortunate, maybe it's uh, as it should be, but there is no turning back. We, we can't stop doing business this way. This is the only way to, to do IT business. Uh, and at the same time as, as you're spreading your data around in all these ways, it's getting more centralized in different actors, uh, suppliers, uh, cloud suppliers, uh, data centers. So one, one organization's data is spread out, but at the same time, many organizations' data are concentrated in one place. And... Uh, that makes you very vulnerable because an attack against one of those may hit you, even though you were, were not actually the target. And as, as a good Swedish example how this can, can happen, the, 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 Tito, the Tito crash the other year, uh, I wasn't the result of an active attack, but still, nobody thought that one problem could affect so many different uh, players. And together, I, I think Jim said before that uh, there are many parties that you, that you need to trust. And I'm saying that you probably don't even know who you're trusting today. So from a military context, uh, how are these changes affecting the military and is it any different for us? Um, in many ways, it's not. It's, it's the same changes. But in some ways, I think we're less prepared than, than most of, of the private sector for this type of change. Uh, traditionally, we've had a, a very strong focus on, on the confidentiality part of security in military organizations, which is sort of obvious, if somebody knows plans for defending ourselves, it's going to be a problem when, when the war starts. Uh, but with, with this, these changes and so much of, of our information and so much reliance on, on the IT technology, the availability issue is getting much, much more important. And that takes sort of a change in mindset for us to, to start working with those aspects more. Uh, and I think in the Cold War area, perhaps we were a little better at that because uh, we had a, a civil defense that would make the whole, uh, uh, the whole society less vulnerable in, in the event of a war or crisis. But since the change uh, from the Cold War, uh, that has become much less of a focus. We also have a traditional way of protecting our data. 
uh, and that's by having uh, air-gapped systems disconnected from the rest of the world. If they're even connected to a network, it's probably through a, a high-grade encryption device that's uh, developed in a secret way and, and that we trust. Uh, traditionally, also, networks have been uh, on, on our own cabling, on the radio links, and so on. But very much of our business, at least in peacetime, is now done on or, or using public networks and parts of public infrastructure. And, and that makes that sort of protection much more difficult to apply. So we, we, we can't really use that way of, of protecting information if we need to exchange that information with other parties, like civil organizations, uh, other agencies and so on. Uh, and that, that need for, for communicating with others is increasing all the time, even for us. Uh, so, so one example are, are international military uh, missions for peacekeeping. So for example, in, in the ISAF, uh, International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan, there were 47 nations in that mission. And you can imagine the, the complexity in trying to, to make all those communicate and share data and so on. And um, a lot of them brought their own IT systems to, to uh, the mission, and some of them were connected. So even even the secret systems, we had to find ways to exchange information. Much more difficult than in the traditional way, and so on. So I want to talk a little about uh, how um, we, or at least I think, that this is changing the threat. Um, how is a potential adversary going to take advantage of, of, of this increased complexity and, and the way our data is spread out? Uh, how are they going to try to pick our digital locks? And I think the most important aspect of this, or the one I want to highlight today at least, is that they will take advantage of the complexity and try to find the weakest point they will try to hit the soft targets. And they will also try different ways of getting the same goal. If you don't succeed in one way, or you find somebody else to, to try to attack to get the same information or shut down the same, same business. Why, why try to hit the well-protected servers of, of a military if you can uh, achieve the same goal by by uh, attacking the outsourced communication that they rely on. Why try to get the information out of uh, top secret military systems if the same data about the airplane or whatever is available from, from uh, the supplier of that plane and perhaps less well protected there. And uh, one way we're seeing this, that, that the actors are actually trying to pick on the softer targets, is, is that we see state actors targeting private computers of employees. So rather than, than attacking our IT systems, they attack the private computer of somebody and hope that they've taken their secret or sensitive work home with them. So, the, the really interesting for, for us as a military organization effect of this, we, we have to consider how this is going to be used in, in a time of war as well, uh, is how, how cyber operations are combined with other operations. We're seeing more and more that uh, internet-based propaganda is combined with diplomacy, lies, media gambits, 
and traditional military activities in an armed conflict. So cyber espionage and cyber sabotage are, are now tools in, in a security policy toolbox or military armory, if you like, in, in an increasing number of countries. So Crimea is, uh, is one example of, of how this can play out. And uh, the Swedish Defense Research Agency, FUI, has uh, published a report that details some of the things that were going on there. Uh, malicious code was reported from cell phones of politicians. Communications were interrupted, uh, both by, by blocking uh, traffic, especially in, in Russia. Um, uh, the blocking websites and so on, and, and there is even reports of, of cutting of, of optical fibers to, to block communications. And, and this is, is then coupled to information operations where uh, they're leaking phone calls and, and emails that indicate that uh, the Ukrainian leaders were following uh, orders or being uh, the st their strings were being pulled by Western leaders. Uh, um, whether these emails were, were actually fake or, or, or real, uh, that's anybody's guess, but uh, by, by leaking this information and amplifying it in, with traditional media and social media, they were uh, spreading uncertainty and doubt in the West. Uh, and at the same time, probably fear in Crimea and Ukraine. So this is probably very much what, what conflicts are going to look like. Um, uh, Bruce talked about not, uh, he didn't like the, the word cyber war, and I don't like the word cyber war either. Uh, when there's war, there's going to be war, and that war is going to be fought in different areas. Uh, and, and the cyber arena is one of them. Anything before that is probably not war. It's going to have to find other words to describe that. Uh, tanks and troops are still going to be important in, in armed conflicts, of course, but uh, they're just one piece of, piece of the puzzle. And I think it's important to, to note that the, the, the very most skilled attacks we haven't seen yet. Those are being saved for, for some other day. So there is more to come. And the other thing is that this is not something that's going to be targeting just the military. It's going to be targeting all of us if, if we have a conflict that's escalating to this level. Uh, and that's especially because the military are dependent on other actors for, for our own business. So last, uh, a few words about uh, how I think we can address this. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about technology now, uh, because that's a given. You have to have the, the technological defenses in place. But some of the ways I think that you need to think to, to tackle the, the increased complexity and, and in the information landscape. So the first is information management. You need to, to try to find how your information is flowing and where your information is. And this is not, doesn't have to be done just on a, on a PowerPoint sort of high level, but you, you have to go down to the nitty-gritty details and find out who has what data and, and where is it critical for you. Uh, so you need to put the people and the processes in place to, to map out where your information is and, and then continue to manage those assets. The second is procurement. You need people to address procurement of services. You need to put out the right requirements and you read to write the right contracts. 
And this, uh, the requirements are both the technical and the procedural requirements for security that needs to be delivered by your parties. And you need to be able to check this when, once it's in operation. So you need to write to audit or something. And this, as I said before, this is not just what you think of as IT services, because anybody that has your data, you need to think through. Is this critical for me? How is it going to be protected? And so on. And the last hour I want to talk about is cooperation. Once you have the other two in place, you need to start to, to work together with your partners, suppliers, whatever. Uh, you can't just rely on that contract, however well written, to, to make sure that your da information is protected. So after the tough negotiations, it's time to get friends. Uh, and this cooperation, cooperation uh, builds on trust. And to build trust, the best way is to start with people. So get your people together with the people of their organizations. Build that trust between them and make them start seeing the big picture so they can work together when the hit shit hits the fan. Uh, some of what I said today uh, is drawn from, from a trend report that was published uh, by FRA, the police, MSB and ourselves uh, this spring. Uh, there's a lot more in that report. So I, it's, it's a good read, I think. Uh, it's available for download both in English and Swedish at uh, MSB's website, and you can look for MSB 779, which is the publication number of that report. Okay, let me wrap up a little. Uh, whether you're a civilian agency or corporation or defense organization, you're going to have to face very similar threats. So no matter what, you need to uh, get down to it and get to work. And if you don't have the resources to do this yourselves, try to team up in different ways. Or even if you do have the resources to do it yourself, team up anyway, because uh, cooperation is what's needed to, to solve this puzzle. And realizing that it's not just a technical issue. Thank you.